Good morning, everybody. Today, we have the privilege and responsibility of tackling a very tough issue. Today, we're going to tackle the issue of divorce, marriage. Is there ever grounds for divorce? These are things that we're going to talk about today. And the sermon is titled today, It's Time to Take Divorce, the Divorce Issue Seriously. And what we're going to be looking at as we continue to go through the Sermon on the Mount, we've got to address these words of Jesus. While some commentaries that you may look at for Matthew I was, I was shocked to see this. Actually, skip over these two verses. <laughs> we cannot do that. We, we have to deal with these, with these two verses. Find out what does the Lord say about divorce. This is a tough issue. This is a tough issue for many reasons. It's a tough issue because of the vast array of positions that are taken in evangelicalism today. Some people say that divorce is never okay. Some people say that divorce is always okay. Where do you fall in that spectrum and why? This is a tough issue because your view of remarriage will directly be tied to your view of divorce. This is a tough issue because there are various Bible passages, many more than this one, that talk about this issue. And they must be viewed together to come up with a complete understanding of what God's Word says on this issue. This is a tough issue because it's very anti-cultural to teach on divorce can be a scary thing because you don't want people running from the church. You don't want to put, you know, make a dogmatic statement that is an unnecessary hindrance to the gospel being preached. And this is a tough issue because many Christians, even many within our own church, are divorced, have been divorced in the past. And I don't want to purposely, no pastor wants to purposely and intentionally offend or hurt members of his family. But this is the task set before us today. What does Jesus say about the issue of divorce? As we get into this sermon, understand this. That divorce is not the way it was meant to be. The only reason that divorce exists is because sin exists. The only reason divorce happens is because marriage is between two sinful people. But it's not the way it was intended to be. That being said, also know that this sermon is not going to be throwing stones at people who have been divorced in the past. Understand that as we tackle this issue, it's one sinner talking to other sinners about what the holy God of the universe says. This is not going to be to ridicule you if you've had a divorce in the past. The purpose of this sermon and the goal of this sermon is to help you where you're at now live a life that pleases God. This sermon, more than any other sermon I think that's ever been, been preached since I can remember at, at this church, led to lengthy discussion in the office. No joke, hours were spent this week discussing divorce, remarriage, what's grounds, when is it acceptable, is it ever acceptable? And after hours and hours of discussion between me, Pastor Pat and Pastor Jason, we came to this conclusion. This is a hard issue. It's a hard issue. That's what we came to after hours of headaches and scratching. And how does this apply? Head scratching and, 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 and seeing all the various different ways in which people get divorced and reasons. There was discussion in the office about what, why is marriage so important? What's the theology of marriage? What's the theological implications of divorce? Is divorce ever allowed? What does divorce symbolize? Is remarriage ever acceptable? What does remarriage symbolize? And if so, under what conditions? This issue is very, very complicated. 
That's why in Sproul's commentary on Matthew, he says regarding the divorce issue, understanding how these teachings of Jesus apply to all the various situations of divorce requires the pastor to have the wisdom of Solomon. I don't think I've ever seen two divorce cases in my ministry that were the exact same. I have sometimes pondered whether the church should establish a panel of theologians and scholars of Christian ethics who could serve as an appeal board to apply these principles to everyday and real life situations. It's a hard issue. Many pastors today just choose not to preach on it simply because it is a hard issue and because it's so anti-cultural. If you want to make sure that your church isn't, you know, having floods of people come into it, preach on divorce. What we're going to see in this passage today is that Jesus, in these two verses, what he does, not only does he preach on divorce, but he elevates marriage and stresses the need for purity in marriage. To understand this issue, we must understand what Jesus is talking about. And this can be hard. So understand that the goal of this sermon is to keep it as simple as possible. We're not going to get into all the different scenarios and situations because if that were the case, it would be overwhelming and you would leave the church today saying, what was he talking about? And I don't want to purposely confuse you. You know, after, after we spent so much time uh, discussing in the office on Friday, and Thursday and Friday, I went home on Friday night and, and was, was feeding my son. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's a good age where he's at right now. I really enjoy it. He's, you know, two, going to be three in a few months. But he's really beginning to say new things. He's actually starting to speak in, like, complete paragraphs, which is amazing. Um, and so Zeke was, uh, I was feeding him some food. Um, he, he was just getting finished, um, well, he was getting ready to eat. He was finishing up his uh, show on the tablet, um, and it was called Julius, Julius the Monkey or something like this. And um, so the show ended, and, uh, you know, Zeke said, Julius. And so I went to little Zeke, and sitting in his high chair, and I said, Zeke, you know there once was a famous man named Julius. His name was Julius Caesar. And he lived a long time ago, and he was a very powerful man. And Zeke is, he's really looking at me intently, trying to grasp what I'm saying. And Julius Caesar, Zeke, he didn't have any sons that could take over the Roman Empire for him, but he did have a nephew, a nephew whose name was Octavian. And Octavian went to battle with someone else who wanted to have the Roman Empire, a guy named Mark Antony. And Mark Antony liked a girl named Cleopatra. And they fled to Egypt together, but Octavian pursued him to Egypt and beat Mark Antony and Cleopatra and became the sole uh, leader of the Roman Empire. After that, he then was given the name Augustus. And it's at this time, Zeke, that Jesus was born. See, so I'm trying. And Zeke looks at me and says, Daddy, what are you talking about? <laughs> He's never said that phrase before. And Jewel and I just started laughing uncontrollably because he was paying such good attention, like trying to track, okay, Julius the monkey, Julius Caesar, Octavian, Jesus. We're in the Bible now. And uh, he just says, Daddy, what are you talking about? And, and when you get to this issue of divorce, if, if you try to talk about all the different scenarios, you guys will look at me and leave saying, Tim, what are you talking about? So I'm going to try to keep it very simple, okay, and only deal with this particular passage, even though there are many other passages in the Bible that deal with this divorce issue. And when we come to these words of Jesus today, we have to strive to understand them to the best of our ability, even if they go against our opinions on the issue. We can't just skip over these two verses and pretend like they don't exist, because these two verses are almost repeated word for word in Matthew 19 and in Mark and Luke. You can't do that. So today we're going to look at what the King of Kings and Lord of Lords says about marriage, divorce, and the absolute necessity of sexual purity. We're in Matthew chapter 5 today. If you have your Bible, open to Matthew chapter 5 and stand with me as we read the word of the Lord. Matthew chapter 5, we will start 
in verse 27, which was dealt with last week, but he's still kind of on this issue of sexual uh, sin. Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said, this is Jesus talking here, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than the whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual morality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. You may be seated. These are tough words from our Lord and Savior. And as we look at this sermon, the main point that I think Jesus is trying to make here, the main point is that marriage should be held in high honor. It should be honored by all. And it should be kept pure, free from any sexual sin. The main point, marriage should be honored by all and should be kept pure, free from any sexual sin. Now, if that sounds like a Bible verse to you, it is. <laughs> As I was thinking about what is Jesus trying to say, what is Jesus trying to say, I kept thinking of, uh, of this certain verse, uh, and, and I think the writer of Hebrews does a fantastic job of summarizing Jesus' teaching on marriage and divorce in Hebrews chapter 13, 4, when the writer of Hebrews says, Let marriage be held in high honor among you, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. What Jesus is doing in this passage that we're looking at today, not only is he dealing with the issue of divorce, but he is elevating marriage by minimizing the reasons for divorce. And he's stressing the absolute need for sexual purity, just like he did in the preceding, in, in the section right before this. Jesus wants us to know that in this passage, what God wants us to know is that marriage is a lifetime commitment and therefore must be viewed as precious. And Jesus also wants us to know that sexual sin is a destroyer of marriage. So as we get into this passage and deal with the first verse here, verse 31, what we have to understand is that in this section, these two verses, Jesus is confronting a common but wrong conclusion on the issue of divorce. Jesus is confronting here a very, very common. This is what the vast majority of people believed about divorce, but Jesus is going to correct them by saying you don't really understand the issue of divorce. Just as there was a wrong view of marriage and divorce in Jesus' day, there is so too in our day a very wrong view of marriage and divorce. In Matthew 5.31, we read this. Jesus says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. What Jesus is doing here is he's quoting scripture. That is actually in the Bible. Jesus is not saying that, well, the Old Testament says this, but I'm going to tweak that and correct it and now tell you this. No, Jesus is not doing that. What Jesus is doing is saying, this is what the Word of God says. And I'm going to correct how to, how to rightly interpret what the Bible says. Jesus is not trying to change the Word of, the God, the word of God from, from the book of Deuteronomy. What Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to explain that this is what that passage really means when the Bible says that. You see, because the Jewish community had concluded that based upon Deuteronomy 24.1, that divorce could take place for any and every reason. In Deuteronomy 24.1, Moses talks about how a man can give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away. This is what Jesus is quoting 
But what he's going to correct is not the scriptures, because the scriptures are the inspired word of God, breathed out by the spirit of God, and they need no correcting. What Jesus is correcting is the faulty interpretation of what this passage actually means. The Jewish community believed that divorce could take place for any and every reason. The passage that they came to this conclusion with, as I've already mentioned, is Deuteronomy 24.1, which says this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house, and she departs out of his house, and he continues to go on talking about this issue. But this little phrase, if he has found some indecency in here, this phrase began to be interpreted through the Jewish tradition as referring to any kind of thing that the husband deemed was unworthy in his wife. This little phrase, indecency, began to be interpreted by the, the, the Jewish community as referring to any kind of flaw in the woman at all, whether in her appearance, in her character, in her actions. You could give her a certificate of divorce and send her away because you found something indecent about her. Matter of fact, Josephus, famous Jewish historian, this is how he interprets this verse. He says, he that, devire, he that desires to be divorced from his wife for any cause whatsoever. You see right there, this is, this is the common interpretation. Josephus, he, he, he supports that. Let him in writing give assurance that he will never use her as his wife anymore. He that desires to divorce his wife for any reason whatsoever, based upon what Moses, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recorded in Deuteronomy 24.1, faulty interpretations developed over the generations where they began to view that, aha, God says that I can get rid of you for anything. I don't like your cooking. You're gone. You've really stopped trying to care about your appearance. You're gone. I'm bored with you now. You're gone. And the men of the Jewish culture began to think that they could divorce for any reason. In fact, the Pharisees, just like Josephus, say this almost exact same thing to Jesus in Matthew 19, the second time in Matthew where Jesus confronts the divorce issue. In Matthew 19, 3, the Pharisees coming to test and to try to trip Jesus up because they knew how culturally acceptable divorce was and they wanted to see that if Jesus would answer, if he would, if he would become less popular, if, if by his answer on divorce, if people would run from him. And matter of fact, Jesus does take a very anti-cultural approach and even his very disciples are shocked at what Jesus says in that passage referring to marriage and divorce. But the Pharisees, in Matthew 19, 3, say, And the Pharisees came up and asked him, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Or other translations say, For any reason whatsoever. So they, the Pharisees are in agreement with Josephus and with the entire community that a man could just do this. Get rid of his wife for whatever reason. Any reason. Marriage in that time was not viewed as sacred at all. Marriage was something that was cheap. One could simply hop out of it when the person they were married to no longer satisfied them, no longer met their expectations. Our society today is very similar. Our society today needs Jesus' words on the issue of marriage and divorce, divorce more than ever. Because we as a whole view the marriage and divorce issue very similar to the Jewish society of Jesus' day. Anytime you want in our society, you can jump out of your marriage and file for divorce. You can throw the other person aside and look for someone new, someone better, who will bring fulfillment to your life. And this is wrong. We need to listen to Jesus' words on the issue of marriage and divorce. Before we get into the actual statement of Jesus on divorce, we must also understand this, that again here, Jesus is stressing his own authority on this issue. So we must understand that our opinion on the subject of divorce 
really doesn't matter. And we must strive to understand what God says about divorce. In this passage, Jesus is stressing his own authority on the issue. So we must understand that our opinion really doesn't matter. And we must strive to understand what God says about divorce. We are very opinionated people. And we come to conclusions a lot of times based on our experience and begin to treat our opinions as if they were the very word of God. And that is not to be done. Jesus stresses his authority. And we must realize his authority is exponentially greater than our authority. As Jesus commonly does in the Sermon on the Mount, being very God of very God, he did not rely as rabbis of that time did on, well, so-and-so says this about this verse. It's written by this guy who, who learned from this guy, who learned from this guy, who learned from this guy. Jesus says on this issue, I say to you. Matthew 5.32, he is stressing his own authority, and this would have been shocking to the hearers of that day because, because this is either exhibits in Jesus an extreme amount of arrogance that he thinks he's above the teachings of the rabbis and of the traditions of the people, or it shows that he is something like nobody else is, the only person who can rightly interpret Scripture perfectly all the time. And we know, being very God of very God, it's the second option. Jesus doesn't need to rely on the traditions of people about divorce. Jesus says, I say to you, this is how marriage and divorce should be handled. God in flesh is explaining when it is and when it is not permissible to divorce. So as we get into this Second verse here, this, this verse that's loaded. We're going to see that Jesus says two things about the issue of divorce here that we're going to stress, that we're going to talk about. About the issue of divorce, Jesus says, first of all, divorce is not always sinful. Divorce is not always sinful. Again, if in your mind you're thinking divorce is always sinful, humble yourself. Realize that the God of the universe is speaking here. And realize that divorce is not always sinful. Jay Adams, in his helpful book, Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage in the Bible, says this about the issue of divorce. Contrary to some opinions, the concept of divorce is biblical. The Bible recognizes and regulates divorces. Certain provisions are made for it. This must be affirmed clearly and without hesitation. Divorce is not always sinful. We must be careful not to call something that God did not declare sinful to be sinful. Because when we do that, we set ourselves up as the judge over God. And that is the height of arrogance. Your opinion on the issue doesn't matter doesn't matter what your experience happened. Or, or, understand, this is what God says. And also, be on guard that if, you, if you've had really, really hard marriage, but you've made it through, understand that you do not have the right in arrogance to look down on people who do divorce for biblical reasons because it's allowed by God. So don't say it's not allowed. Don't set yourself up in opposition to the God of the universe. There is a biblical place for it. God allows for divorce in certain situations. But here's the thing. He never commands that divorce must take place. God allows for divorce in certain situations. But he never commands that it must take place. So if you're sinned by, against by your spouse for a reason that you could divorce them, you have that freedom. Because God himself gives you that freedom, but understand that it does not mean that you have to exercise that freedom. You can choose to remain in that marriage. God allows for divorce, but he never commands that divorce must take place. Some argue 
Some may argue, I should say, that, well, in the Bible, in Malachi 2.16, God clearly says God hates divorce. And that is true. It is in there. But what that verse means is not that divorce is always sinful. What that verse means is that God hates divorce because divorce always is the result of sin. God hates it when sin screws things up. Because there, if there was no sin in a marriage, guess what? Divorce would not exist. So when the Bible says that God hates divorce, that does not mean that he's pronouncing it always to be wrong. Because if that were the case, then God himself would be wrong. When in Jeremiah 3, 8, he says, I am divorcing Israel and giving her a certificate of divorce and sending her far from me. Wow, if divorce is sinful, then why is God talking about himself in a sinful way? God allows for divorce, but he never commands that it must take place. See, and let's understand this, though, too, that only for the right issues, only for the issues of sexual immorality, which the NIV uses, I like this phrase, marital unfaithfulness and desertion, can a person be rightly divorced. Only for the issues of sexual immorality and desertion can a person be rightly divorced. The issue of desertion is a whole topic for another sermon in 1 Corinthians 7. We don't have time to go there. But these are issues where the Bible says divorce is acceptable. It doesn't have to happen, but it is acceptable. Understand that while women and men have been sinned against and, and do have the freedom when these sins have been committed and they do have the freedom to divorce, understand that they do not have to. I think that it, when, when, when one of these sins is committed against one of the spouses and the spouse chooses to stay... I think this is a beautiful model of the grace of God. Undeserved favor being shown to this other person who sinned against you and you could leave them and be right by the Lord, but you're going to show grace. I think that's a beautiful model of God and his people. Seeing how it's sad, but it's true, the, the result usually is that men are the ones who sin in the area of sexual morality. I just want to say this, that men, if you have sinned against your wife by breaking your covenant vows you made with her by being sexually immoral and she has stayed with you, fall on your knees and thank you thank her for her grace that she showed you thank her that that god has so shown grace to her that it's overflowing out of her to you because she, you do not deserve to have her stay with you she could have been in her right to leave you and the crazy thing is which is sad how men most of the time sin against their wives in this area the sad thing is is not only is 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 the man failing miserably and sinning mightily against the holy Lord of the universe and his wife. But at the same time, he's, he's not modeling Jesus Christ. And in that marriage relationship, when the wife chooses to show grace, she actually is taking the lead in modeling Christ. So, man, if you've sinned against your wife in this area and she's forgiven you and stayed with you, thank her for the grace of God that's flowing out of her. Thank her for how she modeled Christ in your relationship far better than you did. Confess your sin. Be broken over your sin. And love the wife that God has joined you with. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 32, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for on the grounds of sexual morality this, uh, this, this phrase, except on the grounds of sexual morality, is called the exception clause, the marital exception clause of Jesus. And it's used by Jesus both times in the Gospel of Matthew when he talks about the issue of divorce. So it's not just once, it's twice Jesus says this. And the Protestant church has traditionally understood that it is acceptable and it is not sinful for a person to divorce his spouse when sexual sin has been committed. 
You look at the, the history of the Protestant church, this has been the, the accepted understanding, such as in the Westminster Confession, chapter 25, particularly article, chapter 24, particularly article 5 in the Westminster Confession. The Confession talks about how adultery and desertion, sexual morality are all grounds for divorce. So Jesus gives an exception clause here. And the, the, the church has traditionally understood that this means that there are certain times and for certain reasons that divorce is permitted by the Lord. So if you can't be divorced except on the ground of sexual immorality, we had better define what is sexual immorality, marital unfaithfulness. And the Greek word for sexual immorality here is a very common word in the New Testament. It's pornea. Obviously, we get our word pornography from that. And it's a word that's, that refers to much, a much more broad range of sexual sins than simply adultery. It includes all kinds of various sexual sins, homosexuality, incest, indecent exposure, slavery to pornography. According to the word of God, these are grounds for divorce. This is intense. Remember that in the passage just before this passage, Jesus already redefines adultery as it doesn't have to be a physical, uh, extramarital relationship. It can be a man who is a slave to porn in his mind. And that's grounds for divorce. This is, this is intense. Not just adultery is grounds for divorce, but any kind of sexual morality, Jesus says. All sexual sin violates the covenant that two people made before the Lord of the universe. And we're going to talk about why, why it's so grievous to the Lord later on. It's time for the man, the professing Christian who's addicted to porn, to realize this is an issue your wife has the freedom to divorce you over. And if you come begging to the pastor, please, please, make, make her stay with me. Wait, we cannot force her to do that because the Lord, the God of the universe says, this is grounds for it. In the church, it's, it's a shameful thing how we begin to view that adultery is the real big sexual sin. Just looking at porn, just self-pleasuring. It's not that big of a deal. Everybody does it. Jesus says it is a huge deal, and this is grounds for divorce. I wonder if the church actually started preaching on these words of Jesus, if men might be woken up to, wow, my wife could leave me over what I'm doing right now, and she would be okay in the sight of God. Don't come running to your pastor and say, yes, my wife caught me looking at porn, but please make her stay. I can't bind her conscience and say you have to stay because the Lord himself does not bind her conscience, and I don't want to take the place of Jesus. I am, I am a, a humble servant saying, this is what Jesus says. She has the freedom to do this. You should have thought about that before you loved yourself more than you loved God and your wife. This is a big deal. It's time for men to wake up and be on guard. Fathers, fathers, teach your boys. Teach your boys, number one, by your example of purity. And two, by the words of wisdom, teach them. Run, son. Run from the immoral woman. I'm convinced that the reason this is such a blight on the church, why teens, boys are addicted to porn at such young ages, is because fathers have failed miserably to be the kind of fathers that God demands them to be. Men, train your children up to fear the Lord and to know that sexual morality is grievous 
Divorce is allowed by the Lord when it comes to the issue of sexual sin. And by Jesus saying this, this is how he's rightly interpreting Deuteronomy 24.1. Second thing Jesus says in this, in this verse, verse 32, is that divorce, divorce leads to adultery when the basis for the divorce was not sexual immorality. And again, I'm only dealing with the sexual immorality issue because it's here. But again, there is, a, there is an issue of desertion that's dealt with in 1 Corinthians 7. But Jesus in this passage says divorce leads to adultery when the basis for the divorce was not sexual immorality. Divorce for unbiblical reasons is sin. And what it does is it leads to more sin. The sin of adultery being committed. The man who divorces his wife for unbiblical reasons is guilty of causing his former wife to sin by making her commit adultery when she remarries. The man who divorces his wife for unbiblical reasons is guilty of causing his former wife to sin by committing adultery when she remarries. I understand this as well. The, the, the emphasis of this passage uh, this teaching from Jesus is to the men. I think that's for multiple reasons. Uh, number one, I think it's because the, the men are to be the leaders of the home. By their example, they should be showing love and grace. But, but second thing, thing, and probably the more important reason why he's addressing men, is because of the cultural situation. In that society, a wife could not divorce, divorce her husband for any and every reason. It was a society that elevated the opinion of, and authority of the man to the extent where, where the wife, was, she, she had to stay with him no matter how big of a jerk he was. In our culture, it's very different. A wife can slap the divorce papers on her husband. So while the, the specific context is dealing to the man, understand that it's because in that culture, the man was the initiator of the divorce. So what Jesus is really addressing, the principle here, is whichever spouse initiates the divorce, when biblical reasons have not been, been committed, when biblical sins that, that lead to divorce have not been committed, it leads to adultery. Matthew 5.32, But I say that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, makes her. This is a big deal. You are making her sin when she gets remarried. This is the greater sin. Jesus is stressing that by saying you are making her, the, the, the party who's initiating the divorce, you're making the other person, when they choose to get remarried, you're making them commit adultery. This is the greater sin. Because when you get divorced, when you are the initiator of the divorce for unbiblical reasons, not only are you sinning against the Lord, but you are showing a complete lack of concern for the person that God united you with. And it's the greater sin because you are so loving yourself that you are not caring about leading the other person into sin. And in the Bible, this is always a much more grievous sin than you sinning alone. That's why, you know, in Romans chapter 1, the downward spiral of degradation or the downward spiral of sin, you know, many people think, oh, homosexuality is the worst sin on that list. But no, no. The last verse of Romans 1 tells what the worst sin on that list of downward spirals of sin. It's that you take other people with you and approve of them sinning alongside of you. The worst sin in God's eyes is, is when not only you choose to rebel, but you actually force other people to do it with you. This is a grievous thing because you are sinning and now you are hurting the soul of someone else. You're not just sinning against yourself. You are showing a complete disregard for a person that God created in his image. This is a great sin. In this passage, the woman who was divorced for unbiblical reasons 
even though the, 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 the initiator of the divorce makes her commit adultery, Jesus still says what she does when she marries is adultery. She still sins. The woman who is divorced for unbiblical reasons commits adultery when she remarries. And by committing that adultery, permanently severing the previous covenant. When the initiator of divorce is guilty of the greater sin, however, it does not excuse the spouse to just go on quickly and get remarried. Matthew 5.32 But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual morality makes her commit adultery. She commits adultery. If, if the person who has been divorced against for unbiblical reasons, their responsibility and task is even though the divorce has been issued to try to reconcile and lastly the third person that's mentioned in this passage the man who marries the divorced woman when sexual immorality has not been committed sins by violating the union of the divorced couple that in God's eyes is still unified the man who marries the divorced woman when she was divorced for reasons that God does not recognize sins by committing adultery because he's violating the union between that woman and that man that in God's eyes has not been broken because it's only broken for, for sexual morality. Matthew 5.32 And whoever marries the divorced woman commits adultery when sexual immorality has not been committed the goal of the divorced couple must always be reconciliation and simply not move on and try to find another partner divorce is not God's get out of jail free card it's not you can't just file for divorce because you hate each other now because you don't like each other, because the love is gone. If you've been divorced and you're both still single and sexual sin has not been committed, the goal is reconciliation. Divorce for unbiblical reasons just leads to more sin, the sin of adultery. These words of Jesus should cause us to ask two questions. These words of Jesus should cause us to ask two questions. Number one, why is marriage such a big deal? Why is marriage such a big deal in a world where marriage means nothing? Why does Jesus say marriage means a lot? And why does Jesus say that people should stay united together until death and the only reason they shouldn't is when sexual sin has violated the union? Why does Jesus place such a big emphasis on staying together? And I, there's more reasons in this, but I just gave you three. Number one, because marriage was created by God and should be viewed as sacred. Marriage was not man's idea. Divorce was, but God allows it. But marriage was not man's idea. It was God's. It is a sacred institution. Sacred meaning it is, it is something created and made holy by the Lord. Before the fall, before sin ever entered the world, marriage was already established. It's, it's part of the, the, the past Eden that has continued on. Before the fall, marriage was given to the Lord, given from the Lord to man. See, unlike the people of Jesus' time and our time, Christians who are married must take their marriage and view their marriage as something sacred. And they must... And marriage, if you're single, it must be entered into sober-mindedly. That's why, again, our, our, the verse that kind of summed up the teaching of Jesus, Hebrews 13, 4, let marriage be held in high honor by all. That word high honor is the Greek word meaning precious, valuable, extremely important. Everybody, especially Christians, should view their marriage as very important. Marriage was created by God and should be viewed as sacred. Secondly, marriage is a picture 
for the world of what God is like, particularly in reference to Jesus and the church. Marriage is a picture to the world of what God is like, particularly in reference to Jesus and the church. That's why marriage is commonly used in the Bible to talk about how God relates to his people. That's why in Ephesians 5, you know, the, 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 the marriage pat portion, that passage ends with these words, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one. Okay, hey, that's a nice marriage verse. But then Paul flips, flips on his head and says, This mystery is profound, because that verse, what I'm saying, that's not about marriage. That's about Christ and the church. And you see that that verse, um, uh, leaving father and mother and be uniting to his wife and becoming one, that is beautifully, beautifully pictured in the awesome plan of salvation from God where the Father and the Spirit residing in heaven send the Son, the Son leaves. And that's why in John chapter 14 and 16, he refers to the Father and the Spirit as still being in heaven. The Son leaves and what does he come to earth for? To gather for himself a wife. To take for himself a bride. To bring back into part of his family. But the bride Jesus came for, the church, sinful people, were rebellious. And we spurned the very thought of him. Yet his love for his bride was so strong that he went to the cross to die for her so that through his loving death, his bride might see him and see his love and come to know him. This is a picture, marriage is a picture of Jesus leaving his heavenly home and gathering for himself a wife to be his own and being united to her. That's why the Bible commonly refers to Christians being united with Christ, being made one with Christ. This is why the Bible refers to marriage as a one flesh relationship, because it's about Jesus and the church as they're made one. And by the way, that's why, I'm going to get to this a little bit, but that's why sex is so important, because it's, it's the physical picture of, of God showing two people made one. And that's why when it's violated and given to another, it's a, it destroys the covenant. It's the visible sign that a covenant has been made that two become one. And when that's broken, the marriage has been severed. And only the grace of the sinned against party can restore that. Marriage was designed by God to be a picture of Jesus with his people. This is also, also beautifully pictured at creation. Do you ever wonder when you read your Bible, why was Adam created first? Why was Adam created and, and, and left on the earth without Eve? Why didn't God just create them both right away? Because God wanted us to see in the first marriage that Eve was created for Adam. The church, the elect, were created for Jesus. John chapter 10 tells us to be given to him. And this is beautifully pictured in creation that the woman was created for the man and she came into existence by the giving of the man's flesh for her. This is a beautiful picture of Christ in the church. The man gives his flesh to have the woman come to him and the two are made one and entered into a bond that will not be separated, that should not be separated. Knowing this, that, that through marriage, God is trying to show himself to the world. Through marriage, God is trying to say, I'm real, and I really do love my people. And this is, this is why we get married, to be a picture of Jesus leaving and coming and gathering for himself a wife that he is going to love more than he loves himself. And he would do anything for her. Knowing how great this picture is, 
we should not be surprised that marriage is an institution that is constantly attacked. And we should not be surprised that what Satan wants more than anything is for you men to be addicted to porn. Because if he can destroy a picture God has given the earth of what he's like, his plan will move on. One of the ways we combat the, the power of Satan is to be pure and to show the world this is what God is like. Church should not be filled with men who are consumed by lustful passions. The church needs to wake up and begin to think about how God, in his sovereign plan, men, has given you your wife and you are responsible. This is, this is your journey partner through life and you are responsible for treating her as Christ treated his church. And when you engage in sexual morality, you're doing the exact opposite of what Christ did for his church. You're doing the exact opposite of what Christ did for his people. You're showing a complete disregard and hatred for the wife that God gave you. Remember that marriage, if it's a picture God's given to the world, the first people that see this picture are our children. The first way that little Zeke sees the love of God is by me loving my wife, by me loving Jewel. It's no wonder that kids are not excited and passionate about the Lord anymore because at home, they don't see him. At church, they hear, God is love, God is love, God is love, and they look at dad and say, I, he's not loving at all. The marriage bond, understand this, is greater in the family than the parent-child bond. What you should be working on more than having your kids like you is showing love to the spouse that God has given you. Don't let your children come between your marriage. Your relationship with your children is important, but it is not, it is not as important as your relationship with your husband and wife. And marriage should be entered into realizing that it's only dissolved at death. Why is it dissolved at death? Because when we are perfectly with the Lord in heaven, there's no need any longer for pictures of what it's going to be like. That's why there is no marriage in heaven. When we see him as he is, the world of shadows and marriage as a shadow will be gone. And a third reason why marriage is so important is because it is God's way for many of his people to be sanctified for his glory. While it's not the only way or the, even the greatest way, because Paul, you know, in 1 Corinthians 7 says he, says he wishes everybody would be single, but still, marriage is a way that God uses to sanctify his people. It's probably one of the most common things, ways God uses to grow his people. Because when you're married to someone, the sin that you used to hide gets exposed. Husbands are called in the marriage to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That is a high calling. It's, it's, it's tiresome. And, and I don't know, you know how people like Pastor Jason and my dad have, have dealt with it for so long, but I guess because they really love the Lord and love people, but it's tiresome to hear men come in and talk about how their wife doesn't submit, how their wife doesn't submit, how their wife doesn't submit. I don't even know if she's a believer. I don't even know if she's a believer. I Stop it. Understand that you have the greater calling. And the reason why your wife's not submitting is because you're not being Jesus to her. You're not treating her like Christ treated his church. You wouldn't believe that the number of men that come in and say, I don't even know if my wife is a believer. She doesn't submit. Stop it. Get the log out of your own eye. You're no perfect model of Jesus. It starts with you. Because think about this. If the husband is to model Jesus and the wife is to model the church, how does the church know how to act? By looking 
at the one who modeled it for us. The church knows how to act because we look to the testimony and example of Jesus. How does a wife, how did God create it so that a wife knows how to act? By looking to the example of the one that God created in her life to be, to be the perfect model of Jesus. The wife should respond and act as she sees the husband leading. When the husband fails to be the leader that God has created him to be, it's no wonder that the wife is not submissive. Husbands, realize Christianity is not an academic exercise where, where, where you got to impress people by your amount of Bible knowledge and theology content. All that is vanity of vanities if you're not loving your wife. Wives, if you have a husband who's unsaved, I say to you sympathetically, that's not the way it was meant to be. And that's a hard lot. But find yourself living in 1 Peter 2 and 3. Living in the example of Jesus who when he was mistreated responded in grace. To be that wife who models a gentle and quiet and submissive attitude so that her unbelieving husband sees the goodness of God. Two. Two. The second question we should ask is, why is sexual immorality such a big deal? Jesus says this is the grounds for divorce. Wow, why is it such a big deal? It was just porn. I was just pleasing myself. It's not, everybody does it. Jesus says this is grounds for divorce. Why is he consider it such a big deal? Because it's the ultimate way. As I, as I think about that, maybe murder is, is, is more heinous. But, but this is the ultimate way of showing an anti Christ mind. In a marriage, you can't really show a more anti-Christ, uh, child of Satan mind than to be someone who's given to sexual sin. Because the mind of Christ that Christians are called to have is a mind that is completely committed and devoted to serving and loving the Lord and serving and loving other people. And Jesus shows this perfectly by even giving up his life for his people because he loves the Lord. Jesus says that if anyone would could have come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. The man who has no self-control when it comes to sexual sin is not the man who's a disciple of Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus looks like living a crucified life where the driving goal in your life is to love God and love others. Men, if you struggle with sexual sin, repent, bawl, and weep before the Lord at the grievous sin you've committed and begin to live a life being a disciple of Christ, denying yourself. Men, begin to look at your wife and see that this is a soul that God has given you and you are responsible to help her know him. This is a big deal, my brothers and sisters. This is a big deal. And, and, and what we need in the church is not so much therapeutic dealing with sin. Oh, it's okay. Just porn. Every guy struggles with it. Stop that. What we need in the church is to actually use the word of God as a, to rebuke. This is grievous, and a man of God should not behave as such. Stop it. Get your mind off of yourself and love God and love your wife. Let's stop massaging sinners as if it's not a big deal. This is grievous to the Lord. Stop it. Cry for them. Weep for them. Show them by the brokenness of your spirit that, that I can't believe you've fallen into sin. Repent. Repent and be restored. Let's not make people feel okay about their sin on their way to hell. Church, wake up and deal with sexual sin. My congress, this is grievous. This is a sin against the holy God. And every list, every list in the New Testament of unbelievers starts with 
people have committed to sexual sin, the adulterous, the immoral. Such people have no place in the kingdom of God. It's time the church starts preaching that and saying, this is antichrist living. Sexual sin is a big deal because it damages the testimony of Christ. There is something much greater in this life than knowing temporary pleasure. There is something far superior than being a self-pleaser. To know that you can live a life where God is pleased with you, where your Savior is overjoyed by your obedience, this is the best thing in life. People who profess to know Christ and are committed and enslaved to sexual sin, not only are they denying the very Lord who bought them, but they're showing the world a powerless gospel. And the gospel is not powerless. They do damage to the testimony of the Lord. They say they love him, but they deny him by their actions. If you love your, the Lord, Strive for purity. This is a big deal because it breaks the covenant of marriage that was made before the Lord. Marriage is not to be taken lightly. It is no little matter to make a commitment before the Lord. A commitment that is agreed upon, agreed upon to last till death. Uh, you know, marriages still say till death do his part. What does that even mean anymore? Next week, we're going to look about how Jesus says, don't take oaths in vain. That could be tied very nicely into this. When you break your covenant you made before the Lord, you sin against your spouse, and you lie to God. Prove yourself to be a liar. The adulterous woman in Proverbs 2.27 is said to have forgotten the covenant she made before her God. Hebrews 13, 4. Let marriage be held in high honor. For God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. So application, as we wrap this up, this was a hard teaching. But if you're single, if you're single and have, have never been married, what I say to you is live pure. Live pure. Sexual sin is a, is a really, really, really big deal. Don't think foolishly that I can be a slave to porn, but then when I get the opportunity for sex and marriage, that that, that will so satisfy this craving that it will be gone. That is a lie. If you're single, be pure. Ladies, if you're looking for a husband to marry, make sure he's pure. It's more important than if you find him attractive, if he has a good attitude. None of that will matter when you're in your marriage and he's, he's committed sexual morality against you. If you're married, model Christ. Serve one another. Be pure and stay together. If you've married, stay together. Be pure. Do not give any, any way for the marriage to be broken up. Have the mind of Christ. You know, uh, people who are in here, it, it, let, let's do this. If you have been married for longer than 30 years, okay, stand up. Let's give a round of applause. Yes. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness. What a great testimony of the gospel of grace. Your homework is on your way out of the church. Go to one of these people that was standing and thank them. Thank the Lord for them, for the faithfulness that they've shown to one another. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. If you have been divorced for unbiblical reasons, and are now remarried, understand that divorce was sinful. Repent, and then rest in the forgiveness of God. Don't, don't let Satan torment your soul by sins on the past. You can be forgiven. And be pure.
so that the relationship you're in now doesn't get broken by sexual morality. If you've been divorced for unbiblical reasons and are currently single, if there is a possibility for reconciliation, try to be reconciled and be pure. In the Beatitudes, Jesus tells us, Blessed are the pure, for they shall see God. Marriage is a big deal. Sexual sin is a big deal. And we, those of us who profess to know Christ, should be people who hold marriage in high honor and who strive for purity. Because Jesus himself very King of kings and Lord of lords who will one day come back to take those of us who are eagerly awaiting his coming to be with him. Jesus said, I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife except in the grounds of sexual morality makes her commit adultery and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus Christ and how he is the perfect model of a grace giver who did not treat his bride as her sins deserved. Lord, if Jesus repaid us how we deserve, we would be cast far from his presence for eternity. But he shows us what it looks like to be a husband, to love unconditionally, to love unconditionally. So Lord, may we the men who are married in this church be a model of Christ. May we not think that somehow it's our wife who's holding the marriage. Lord, may we not be so blind to sin. May we realize that we are the more responsible party. We are, have been given the bigger task of imitating Christ in this marriage. So may we walk worthy of the calling we've been called to. And may we live holding marriage as a sacred union May we hold it in high regard because it's a picture of you and your church. And may we flee from sexual sin and be a pure people, holy, devoted to you. In Jesus' name.